break. There we go. Hello. Welcome, everyone. Uh, this is our June meeting. It's also the third anniversary of our meetups. So, it's uh, so a very significant milestone, I think. We've been doing this for three years. Hard to believe sometimes. But, uh, we've got a lot to cover this meetup. Uh, besides what's new, uh, John is going to tell us about Get Notify a little later on. Um, we're probably going to cut the stream when we go to open discussion because uh, there'll probably be some NDA, NDA talk. So uh, <laughs> just to stay on the up and up, we're going to kill the live stream at that point. So we're just going to go right into the what's new bit. <clears throat> so uh, as usual, you know, we'll talk about the iOS, tvOS, and watchOS updates that were released since we were last here. Uh, talk about High Sierra and Safari 11, uh, Office updates, Jam Pro 10, and uh, we'll do a special WWDC recap, uh, as well as the security roundup and any items of interest that caught our eye while we were away. And of course, you know, uh, mentioning of the upcoming conferences. So right to it, iOS 11. So iOS 11.4 was released. Uh, among the notable things is AirPlay 2 support and HomePod stereo pairing, uh, as well as iCloud messages, which I don't know of anybody who's actually using that yet. But uh, well, now I know one person who's using that. <laughs> and um, as usual, uh, there are patches for 35 CVs affecting 15 different processes. Um, link goes right to the security article on that. Um, Moving on to TV and watch OS, uh, tvOS uh, 11.4 was released with AirPlay 2 support, which is a very uh, descriptive summary I know. Details are on the link. Uh, again, 24 CVEs addressed affecting eight processes. <coughs> watch OS 4.3.1 released. This fixes uh, an issue where uh, it would not, it would hang on the Apple logo during startup. <coughs> I I don't think it affected anybody uh, I know who has an Apple Watch, but it definitely was something that you know, happened to a lot of people. Um, 20 CVEs affecting eight processes were patched in this version. <laughs> As always, make sure you patch because some of these uh, some of these CVEs include like the uh, and I didn't mention it in the security roundup, but it was uh, the one uh, that's affected that's patched in everything is uh, the eFail vulnerability for SMIME stuff. Uh, <clears throat> but moving on to Mac OS High Sierra, 10.13.5 was released. Um, of concern to uh, our, our interests, relevant to our interests, as the saying went. Uh, this properly expands SCEP variables and SCEP payloads on configuration profiles, and those same profiles now will now install properly when you disable any key extractions. Uh, so when you actually set the key extraction to false, the configuration profile will now install correctly where it wasn't doing that before. Um, <clears throat> 32 CVEs affecting 24 processes. The big one, obviously, is the uh, that eFail vulnerability that the people were talking about. Um, and uh, security update 2018-03 for Sierra No Capitan was also released. Not all the uh, things that were patched for a High Sierra were patched for Sierra and El Capitan. Uh, so do check out the article to see what applies to uh, El Capitan and Sierra. Specifically, if you have clients that are still on that. And I forgot to update this one on Safari 11.2, but uh, or was it 11.1? It was 11.1. Yeah, I just forgot to update the link on that, but another patch for the patches for those. Moving on to Office 2016, which uh, in a couple of months will change to Office 2019. Uh, 1613 and 1614 were released while we were away. Uh, usual fixes to Outlook, Word, Excel, and PowerPoint, as well as new features for 0365 users and bug fixes. One of the things for 0365 users get in Outlook 1614 is groups, which is essentially, uh, you know, you can have DLs and contact groups. 
uh, in the 0365 version of Outlook. Uh, <coughs> that is probably won't be coming to 2016. Well, it may be in 2019. Yeah, what's up? So, <coughs> uh, relevant to our interests, <coughs> MS Auto Update is version 4.0 was released. This is the fully baked version of uh, the super auto update client, which includes the command line. Uh, so you can automate the updates and push uh, as needed. So, and Skype for Business 1618 if you want the news. <coughs> Still waiting for the, the Skype to Teams transition. Never. Yeah, when are they killing that? They're like, so, and <clears throat> finally, Office 2019 was announced. Uh, the link details the uh, Microsoft blog announcement for it. Um, <clears throat> essentially, the 2019 is just a branding exercise, and it really only applies to licensing. So depending on the license final file you get installed, uh, dictates which version of what features are available to you in that particular version. Um, I think what they're saying um, is that um, the bits are all the same in the near future, the version of if you go Office 2019 preview now, it's the same bits as 1614 in 20, Office 2016. It's just the licensing unlocks a few extra features. If you want all the features, you have to go 0365. And you just have an 0365 license. Um, 2019, as I said, will get some new features. And we'll be getting all we'll be getting new features added as we go on. I think there it wasn't quite clear, uh, and I may have missed it since I haven't been in the Microsoft Office Slack channel a lot lately. <laughs> but it wasn't clear to me whether or not the um, whether 2016 will stop getting um, will stop getting updates entirely, or just will not be getting any more features anytime soon, and we'll still get like security updates. For, um, so I think what they say, 2020 or something like that. So, uh, but included on the slide link when we share it out to everybody is uh, the matrix that Paul Bowden made uh, that includes the uh, you know, what features are available for which licensing. So you can see what's going to be available in 2019 as things come out and what is currently available for 2016. So <laughs> check that out if that's uh, something of interest to you. So moving along, so while we were away, uh, Jamf released two versions of, uh, of the Jamf Pro server, 10.4, which was released back in May right after our meeting, um, <clears throat> and quickly followed by 10.4.1 because of uh, some issues that came up. This uh, added uh, UAMDM approval notifications through self-service, basically uh, so if Jamf detects that uh, there is a MDM profile that hasn't been approved. It'll notify the user through self-service automatically. Um, added the uh, idea, the ability to suppress proximity setup for iOS devices, uh, and uh, added the ability to change the recon timeout value for some instances where the fault two minutes wasn't long enough or maybe too long. <coughs> And of course, GPDR support. Uh, and as usual, there's lots of product issues and defects that were closed. The link goes to them specifically, so you can see what see if your product issue or defect was closed in this version. So, Server 10.5 uh, that was released uh, actually like last uh, almost a week and a half ago at this point. So. Um, Self-service for iOS got a revamp on this version. Uh, and you can now enable and disable Bluetooth for 10.13.4, <coughs> uh, which may be important. The big one, though, is to disable the network state change trigger. Now, if uh, you're like us, then where the network state change, state change trigger would uh, interrupt an enrollment trigger, and then you couldn't get it back for, you know, well, you had to wait like uh, what, 15 minutes, five minutes, or something like that. Wow. Yeah. It used to be one hour. But I think they changed it so the timeouts you know, two yeah. hours. Yes. So, <laughs> but now you can completely disable the next stage change. 
So, <coughs> so for one, even if you're not using it, you'll see that trigger happen at a bit of time. So if, you know, your logs will at least be a little less cluttered now if you disable it, uh, which might be a benefit in, in of itself. Um, they made some changes to webhooks and script editor uh, to make it better. Um, I think you can do more things in the actual script editor, um, <coughs> like I can actually use it to actually edit scripts as opposed to just copying and pasting in like I think everybody else does. Um, the other thing they announced was to the Jamp API, Jamp Pro API beta. This is essentially a rename of what they called the Universal API up until then. <laughs> Um, but with the announcement uh, they made today, uh, all the new changes are going to happen through the Jamf Pro API. Um, I think one of their main concerns is they're going to take what they're calling the Classic API, which is sort of traditional Jamf API, um, the one where you go, uh, you know, your JSS slash API, and you have that list of all of stuff. And they are going to basically build out the Jamf. Pro API so that it matches all that stuff before they even take away any of that. So, but the goal is they want everything to go through the Jam Pro API completely. And <coughs> I think I've heard them say that they're eventually going to, at least internally, have everything go through the API. So even the web UI itself will be going through the API to talk to the database. So that's, at least that's their plan. So that's a big one. Other things was uh, the JDS has finally been removed out. So if you're using any JDS, currently do not upgrade to 10.5 until you replace that. That's and and uh, they've also switched, they've also dropped support for TLS 1 and 1.1. 1 .1. So it's now TLS 1.2 only. Um, and uh, that's the concern. Maybe you want to hold off on to. 10.5 until you are ready to support TLS 1.2 in your environment. And of course, as usual, there's a weekly food list of all the product issues and defects that were closed in this version. <coughs> Moving along to security roundup. So there was a new CrossRider malware variant discovered, or at least uh, reported while we were away. This one installs config pro profiles for the systems. And I think uh, Mike had a mm -hmm. case of that where he ran into that. So, uh, um, so our friends at uh, Malware Bytes uh, <laughs> detailed all that. Thomas details all that in the link that we're providing here. But uh, yeah, the config profiles, it's a new behavior for malware. So that's something that we might be looking at forward. And with Apple's push to do, you know, basically restrict everything to MDM through four profiles, this may be a thing where UA MDM, despite its headaches, is uh, going to be useful, a useful thing to have so we can confirm that profiles are installed. Um, they're doing good. <laughs> big news, other big news, uh, VPN filter, this is malware, persistent malware that affects routers. And uh, I think the estimate that I saw in some articles was 500,000 devices affected at a minimum. And we're talking routers uh, all from both consumer and enterprise scale. So, and it's like from all different manufacturers. It's, uh, and it's pretty nasty. So, um, details provided in the link, uh, I think, I was going through it. I don't remember if they, there's probably a patch, but things like enterprise routers will probably get patched for consumer routers. And for consumer routers, depending on how old it is, your best bet might be just purchase new. So. <laughs> uh, GP, GDPR is now in effect, um, which, unless you are, unless you deal with no, all domestic clients period, or d domestic users, period, probably won't affect you. But if you talk to anybody in any European country, uh, you, they're probably going to be affected by GDPR. So uh, make sure you update your privacy notifications and email them now to all your customers. <laughs> um, 
So um, another big news which happened actually quite recently was the RTE, RTE remote code execution vulnerabilities found in Git. Uh, and uh, the, the, so the vulnerabilities are patched in, I think, uh, was it, uh, I forget the exact version, but uh, if you use Git at all, you need to update like yesterday. Um, last week, actually, or two weeks ago, now that I think about it. Um, for anybody who's using default Git that comes with Mac OS, you need to update to Xcode 9.1. Uh, that has the patched version of Apple Git, as I'm calling it. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, so if you, you, you rely on anything, Git for anything, and that includes things like auto package, you want to make sure your update. Uh, update that kit uh, sooner rather than later. So. <clears throat> a new fun thing from our friend Patrick Worrell discovered that uh, Quick Look caches uh, preview pictures and paths and other sorts of metadata from encrypted volumes even when the mount, even after they've been unmounted. So it stores that. Uh, <clears throat> there's a uh, there was a sound debate over you know, how severe this sort of vulnerability is because it requires you to have physical access to the device in order to exploit it. So if the drive is file vault encrypted anyway, uh, uh, so you have to basically, in order to exploit this, you need physical access. To it. it can't be exploited remotely. So. Uh, there's been a lot of debate on how severe this is. And uh, hopefully Apple takes a look at this, and at least maybe not for High Sierra, but maybe address it in an upcoming building or something like Mojave or something. Mm -hmm. uh, especially since you know, they do some interesting new things with Quick Look in Mojave. So. <clears throat> and more good news. Uh, there was a code signing vulnerability found in Mac OS. And, um, so there's been some, again, this is, there's some controversy about this specifically because uh, I think it's one of those things where Apple's documentation may not have been clear enough to all developers and which they were told to do to uh, verify against something. But uh, the vulnerability is basically it's possible for you to, uh, uh, like the code signing verification only verifies partially. It doesn't actually verify the whole shebang. Uh, <clears throat> so it's possible to have an Apple signed binary and also um, other unsigned binaries or, or third party signed binaries in there. And uh, <clears throat> rather than check the whole thing, I think Apple, uh, the, this vulnerability just basically verifies that just the one Apple binary signed and not everything else has been signed correctly. So <clears throat> I think I think that's my understanding. So, but essentially, again, yes, it's a, it's a vulnerability. Um, I don't know. Last time I looked at this, I hadn't sort of it was best yet or will be addressed. But as I said, there's been some controversy whether this is whether this is a fault fault for on developers or fault on Apple. Uh, what's the last time I looked at it? But, uh, the details are uh, linked in there that probably have more answers that I didn't have time to refresh myself on today. So it was, uh, it was different binaries in the universal binary. Yes, different binaries in the universal binary. Yes. Thank so you. Like an I386. Right. You know, right. Right. Oh yes, yes. that's right. Mm -hmm. So you get a good sign for a particular binary. A, but have other binaries in there that are not verified. That's what it is. Thank you, Jim. So, item of interest. Uh, Monkey 3.3 was released. Uh, adds better detection of local repos that prefer a specific URL stream, uh, scheme. I think it's uh, uh, <coughs> monkey.domain.com slash repo. I think, I, think, I think it's just, yeah. 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 So. It was something like that. And also, uh, extra, the added conditional items for comparison include OS build number and last component. And more details 
uh, <coughs> to follow that. So, uh, other item of interest: Microsoft is buying or has bought GitHub. So, uh, <coughs> at least from our perspective, that it would just means that we'll probably end up saving money because we're already giving Microsoft money. <laughs> But anyway, take it. So, um, yes, yeah, and you know, and then like the next day after that, after everybody said migrate to GitLab. GitLab has an average. So, yep. <laughs> Conferences. Uh, next month um, will be PSU Mac Admins. We will have a, a pretty decent contention out there. So if you're uh, watching from some other location and uh, we'll be at KCU Mac, ends, Mac admins, uh, please look out for the Philly guys. Uh, they'll have, going, sir? I'm not going. Okay. So they'll have they'll have uh, stickers and buttons to give away. Uh, and if uh, if we have we still have shirts left over, we may even have some shirts to give away. So and if you see a Philly guy, flag them up. There's some stickers, buttons, and magnets that have pizza. So, and the next, the next giant conference is uh, the JFD Eastern User Conference, uh, which will be in October. And I still have to fix those dates because it's not one day; it's like three. Yeah. Um, and the request for speakers actually closed on June first. Uh, has anybody heard back uh, whether they got in yet? So, yeah, okay. So maybe like another week. They probably get thousands. Right. Yeah, we. <laughs> so. WWDC 2018. I'm not including the pictures I, I've drawn because I know on the press end, San Jose was beautiful. <laughs> that's uh, all you're saying. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> so uh, the big one of the big announcements is obviously iOS 12, the next step up. Um, one of the big features they announced was the digital health dashboard to manage your usage and also your kids' usage if you are one of those who, have, who has kids who use iOS devices. So um, the other big announcement was um, Emoji, which they spent a lot of time on. Um, um, but you know, you got to have a little sizzle. The Emoji was a sizzle. Uh, yep. Group FaceTime, uh, you will be able to have a group for up to 32 uh, participants, um, which I don't know how unwieldy that will be, but you could. Um, essentially, you can do you can do conference calls with FaceTime now is what that is. I don't know how many people will actually be using that. Uh, the, probably the most underrated announcement they made is Siri shortcuts. Uh, which is essentially bringing automation to iOS, so you can be able to do things, more things with your iPhone and iPads than you could before. So this is a very, at least along the power user set, more than likely, is very heavily anticipated. And I think once people actually get it in their hands, it'll probably become very, uh, uh, you know, probably become very useful to a lot more people. I was very excited for this when I was thinking. This would finally be a way that I could tell my car to unlock the Siri. <laughs> and then I looked up CarPlay, and that feature's already there, but Chevy. Uh, so you're blame <laughs> Chevy. Have car. So I do have CarPlay. I don't. Uh, until next year. Because Apple is uh, into is heavily invested in AR, and they made some more AR advancements. Um, there's basically you can collaborate and interact with other people through AR. Um, <laughs> And they had basically multiplayer. Yes, I didn't get a chance to play that game when I was there. It was there, uh, although it was kind of unwieldy looking at people doing this with their iPads. <laughs> um, other announcements: they're making improvements to notifications. So basically, group you can group. They will thread notifications, so you don't have like a whole list of Slack notifications. And really, it's Slack for everybody, isn't it? Um, and they made more. Uh, uh, more improvements to do not disturb photos. Uh, one thing that uh, probably a little uh, under the radar is they're preventing share and comment buttons from tracking you, so better privacy protections there. We move on to tvOS and watchOS. Um, so tvOS gets Dolby Atmos support for Apple TV 4Ks. Um, 
which means better sound through systems. So uh, that will be that'll be good for everybody who has an Apple TV 4K. Um, I don't know if it will actually move more Apple TVs, but um, it'll be on there. The, and the other thing is zero signings, where is you won't, you won't be prompted a second time to sign into services like uh, streaming services from providers if you're on the network. Right, if you're on their net, if you're already on their network, you won't be provided. You won't be prompted to authenticate again. <laughs> so uh, at this time, at the time of the announcement, only Charter Spectrum uh, will uh, support was announced. So we'll see if any of the other companies. Uh, <clears throat> I have a question. No, I have a question. Yeah. Does Comcast yeah. support the single sign again? No. Okay. Just <laughs> they don't do it on the road. Yeah. Um, we can talk about that thing. <laughs> so Watch the OS 5 was announced, uh, fitness competitions. It essentially, it was uh, one of the things you can do. You can be more social with your fitness thing. So you can uh, trash talk your friends, uh, which I know I'm sure is very important for this group here. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> and uh, probably one of the more useful ones is WebKit for Watch OS. So uh, links can you can actually view web content actually on your phone, which you can't do a lot of right now. Um, and uh, the big one, obviously, is walkie-talkie. This is a sizzle. Uh, it works over Wi-Fi and cell. And uh, I think it so, but I think it works better if it's on cell service. So uh, if you have like if you have one of like the Series Three or whatever newer phones, it's probably the one it's meant for. Um, but this is, uh, you know, we, we can all be Dick Tracy now, ah. now finally. <laughs> you know, 60 years after, or 70 years after, you know, we first saw the watch. <clears throat> and of course, Mac OS Mojave. Uh, <clears throat> big feature there is dark mode, which, took, which I, I didn't really realize how you know everybody was jonesing for dark mode on Mac OS until I was there, and everybody erupted in cheers when they announced it. So mm. who knew? But dark mode is coming. Uh, uh, one of the things that they debuted was this idea of stacks. So uh, and you know as you, as you saw in the keynote, you know you had we've all had users who have like a million things on the desktop, and now <coughs> stacks will um, at least clean that up and put them all similar things in uh, on top of each other essentially and then you can go and take a look at all that stuff. And I'm sure that'll probably annoy several users who knew exactly where every file was on their desktop. And now it's all been migrated on stacks and now they can't uh, they don't know where anything is. But for everybody else I'm sure it'll probably be uh, a welcome addition to things. Yeah, this, is, this would be addition. So just like it would just basically it's addition to the folders. Basically just like I think they were mainly concerned about like single files in different locations will basically stacked up. Right. Yeah, the stacks can be grouped similar to it's only but I think it's only a range of by. So right, right. It could be grouped by name or type or there were a bunch of different criteria. So and they're <laughs> so they're making improvements to the Finder finally as well. We're doing things like adding a gallery view. You can do quick actions on some things, uh, and, and, uh, and you now can get like complete metadata information on files you look at in the Finder. Uh, as I mentioned before, you can now do more things in Quick Look. You can perform actions like you can do minor editing and. Like on PDF files, you can start, you can modify, mark up PDF files, and among other things, uh, you quick look there. And they made improvements to the screenshot tool, uh, <coughs> so which I think is, uh, uh, <coughs> which you know I think uh, uh, <coughs> creeps into Snagit's market share at that point. So you can actually do. You can actually also do edit video. I think a little bit in there, um, from what I remember. And uh, continuity camera, which is basically you can take a photo with your uh, iPhone or iPad, and you can sh 
share that photo with the Mac, and then you can do it, uh, edit that stuff, edit it, and then drop into a PowerPoint presentation. And, uh, I'm sorry, not PowerPoint, uh, keynote presentation. So I am going for that. So more stuff. This required two slides because there was so much stuff on Mahalo. Uh, group FaceTime is also coming to the Mac, obviously. Uh, and the Mac gets versions of the iOS apps, news, stocks, home, uh, home kit, which I forgot to, I guess I misspelled there, and voice memos. So, uh, which is something we'll talk about because of the way those things came over is uh, something that is developers are eagerly awaiting. Uh, and the Mac App Store itself got a makeover, uh, and it looks really nice. And looks a lot better, so it's a welcome change. Um, been improvements to Safari specifically, uh, enhanced tracking prevention, much like what the, uh, they did on the iOS side. They're also doing on the Mac Safari side, and this idea called automatic strong password is where I actually suggest a strong password and help you fill it out, fill it in. And so. <coughs> uh, Making it easier for the users to actually <laughs> use uh, strong passwords. And uh, have icons in Safari, so, or fave icons, or whatever. So, <clears throat> so normally at this point, since we, since we don't have a, another presentation, we would just go right to open discussion. But since John is here with his presentation, <coughs> I'm notified, we're going to switch over to him. And then we'll come back and we'll talk about uh, all the other stuff that I can't talk about publicly. And then uh, we'll, we'll kill the stream. So. Yep. Am I in frame? <laughs> yes. No, all right. I think I should be OK just doing a. <clears throat> Weird having TVs all around me. Nobody's watching. Uh, did you change the input over here? You gotta plug it in. I was there playing, but that's fine. Nice test. I'll do it the old fashioned way. <clears throat> this isn't actually the active way. Uh, Okay. So I'm going to be presenting today on leveraging DEP Notify with Jamf Pro for device enrollment yeah. deployment, or how I learned to stop imaging with DEP. Uh, just a little about me. <clears throat> First, let me set up my presenter view here because it's really hard for me to. Keep looking behind me and next to me. <clears throat> uh, I'm the Network Systems Administrator at University of the Arts in Philadelphia. Uh, everybody here most likely knows all this. I'm going to probably just rehash it for those that might be watching or for recording later. Um, I've been there since December 2015. Um, I am Jay Malman on various platforms, Slack, Git, Jamf Nation. Um, I am on Twitter. I don't give that out. It's a personal one. If you find me, I'm sure you'll figure out who I am. And you can add me. I'm not going to fight. Just know that that's a personal one. Um, and I have a little blog website right there, yearofgeek.net. Uh, I don't post a lot, very often. It's mainly just for documenting procedures and things that we do. So I have them for later. And so I can share them with my uh, my colleague. And if I leave and he has the information, also to help others. Um, but actually, the reason I'm doing this presentation is because I wrote uh, two posts about this. Um, and I got a lot of questions from people. and. I said, hey, maybe I should do a presentation on that. So, and this presentation will also be able, available on tinyurlcom slash hyphen dep notify um, We we'll probably put it in the notes for the meetup too, or something. What on the website too? Yeah, I'll probably put it somewhere on the website or on GitHub. So, but yeah, you can jam out. Uh, I work for University of Arts, as mentioned. So, just. Quick glance, stats at a glance. We have around 1,800 students spread right across six buildings in the heart of downtown Philly. We're a majority Mac campus with only a handful of Windows machines. So we have over 200 labs. 
or excuse me, 200 lab machines and a little over 20 labs, 40 smart classrooms, which are just single systems hooked up to a AV system. And a bunch of other student facing machines such as uh, studios and production suites. Um, we also manage all the office systems, faculty and staff laptops, which are university provided. And we have a BYO system for the students. So we only give them access to self-service. We don't manage anything else with the student um, devices. So the majority of the students at the university, actually probably about 99% of the students have Macs. We have a lot of variations in our systems, uh, everything from 2009 machines um, to 2017. I did look in our Jam server, and we did have some older ones, believe it or not, that are still in use, and they're running 10.6. Um, because people don't take them out often. They, they take a laptop home or something, or they're in a desk somewhere. Um, so yeah. Um, there are also a lot of different operating systems. We use 10.9 uh, to 10.13 uh, in our, that we have in the majority of our systems. Uh, we've had an on-prem Jam Pro server since 2012 with a little over 1,700 systems in there at any time. Um, and for the purpose of this presentation, so I don't go really long, um, I'm going to focus only on the faculty and staff laptops. So that, it's actually the one that I started first. It's the the, way, uh, the, the system I perfected first. Um, we're still working on the, uh, the public machines. So let's go back in time a little bit. And by back in time a little bit, I mean just a few months, maybe a few weeks for some of us. Maybe not long at all for somebody like me, who we still do some, some sort of imaging. So not too long ago, that's so what our imaging process looked like. I'm sure everybody here can relate. It's sent out in the before time, the long, long ago, you know, three months ago. Um, you could send this command out or something like that to a bunch of your systems using ARD or Jam for Mode or whatever your method. And your machine will boot to a netboot server. And then your imaging app, in our case, Jam for Imaging, would just take over. And you would then just go grab a beer and just come in the next day or, or the next week, and your machines will be imaged. It'll be nice and happy for most time. And we did this a lot. Is that uh, from there, yards? Excuse me. Yes, that's, yeah. a, that's a picture from Yard. That's a picture that I took from Yard. One of my favorite beer pictures that I've taken, actually. Um, in the summer, this is what we did. We, we sent out the command or we set up a policy for a queue up a bunch of labs and they would just go at night and we could do it from home. We did it from, we would work from home for some for some days and we would come in and oh, 12 labs were just re-imaged and it was really awesome. It also worked well for faculty laptops. You know, you would load up Jamf Imaging. The tech would then select whatever configuration you wanted and boom, it would go. Things were good, excuse me. Then it happened. Then. Apple gave us High Sierra. And they gave us this update. Apple does not recommend or support monolithic system imaging as an installation method because blah, 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 blah. Basically, firmware would get dropped down at installation. No way around it. No real way around it. And Apple's saying, OK, we're not going to support monolithic imaging anymore. But just because Apple doesn't support it doesn't mean it's not going to work, right? I mean. They, don't, they didn't support MCX for years, and it worked forever. It still technically works. Well, then 10.13.4 came out and gave us ukulele. Uh, system kernel, uh, excuse me, user approved kernel extension loading. So you would want to load up your antivirus. Well, you have to approve it manually. No way around it. Well, that was OK for a little while. Then UAMDM, user approved MDM. So this kind of killed automated imaging starting with 10.13.4. Um, so question that's been asked for months now, is imaging actually dead? Well, took a look in Google, and you can see there's a ton of things here. One of my favorite ones is obviously that imaging is dead along with imaging because it will never die. Um, but anyway, we'll look at Armin Bregel's. Armin Bregel? That's it, yeah. Oh, so. He was saying it's dead. Well, I'm going to go to Jamf Nation too, and it looks like people are basically learning how to deploy 1013. They're learning how to image again. You know, this is stuff that we've we've been doing for a long time, and now we have to relearn how to do it. So, well, is it actually dead? 
Yeah, Jim. Mostly. Because it still technically works. Um, but in a sense of making it easy, it's dead. So nice quote from me last year when I learned that imaging is dying. What are we going to do? So we looked at a bunch of options. Now, this is going to have a lot of text on it, so I'm going to try to breeze through some of it. First option was to stay on 1012. Uh, since most of our software works fine on 1012 and our current workflows work fine, it was a good idea. But security updates are going to stop eventually for that, right? I mean, you can't just always stay on 1012. Uh, new machines were starting to come in with 1013, so that was a big problem for us, and we couldn't image because we couldn't boot our 1012 image to do it, or 1012 net boot, and we didn't want to confuse our text and putting a 1013 one and a 1012 one. It was a, kind of a weird place to be. And then Apple software update. Some Apple software was already only working on 1013, um, looking directly at Final Cut. And Final Cut is used a lot in, in an art school. I don't know if you know that. Um, so Final Cut right now is 1013 only. So that basically was like, OK, you have to go to 1013 for us. Because Logic's going to soon fall. And Logic is one of our higher, most used apps that we have, uh, aside from Ableton. Option two was do an in-place upgrade. So Apple gave us the tools, right? So why don't we use them? So it's a quick process to do an upgrade. You just send out your command with your start OS install flags. And it would do the upgrade. It was great. Um, so what would be good is that there was no more imaging on public machines. So we can just push up the latest software, and, and we wouldn't have to image computers. It's a lot faster. The problem is we did notice that we would have a lot of leftover bits from software. So if we were upgrading things, uh, create uh, if we were upgrading Adobe products from CC 18 to 19 when it comes around, or 17 to 18 when we were doing it, we noticed there's a lot of cruft leftover. We didn't like that because things would start getting a little messy. Um, we did have problems with Premiere stop working after swapping out versions and upgrading. It was kind of a mess. Uh, we also don't know, is imaging going to work post 10.13? I mean, 1014 is not too far on the horizon in the desert of Mojave, where it might just stop working. So we didn't like those either. Option three was our hybrid solution. And I'm going to be, I'm going to level you. This is the one we're using this summer, mainly because we have too many computers that we have to get up to date. And we didn't have, we don't have a lot of time to just futz about with getting um, everything in my DEP notify uh, workflow working 100%. So. This one, what we do is we push out the 1013 installer just to get the firmware update on the machine. And then we netboot them to a 1012 or 1013 netboot set. Trick is to just don't install 1013.4 because if you put 1013.3 on there, there's no UAMDM and you know, no ukulele, UAKEL. Um, so we don't have to worry about that when you upgrade. And then when you run a software update, it just grandfathers it into 10, 4, 10, 13, 4. So hey, we technically imaged in a way, but we also upgraded. Um, again, won't work that long. But you know, we have some of the same issues as above. And once, if we if we get machines that can't run 10, 13, 3, which we've already gotten a few that can't run them, we won't be able to put. 10, 13, 3 on and, then and bypass the UA, MDM, and UA, KEL. So we had to make a, a decision to get a long-term solution. So a couple months later, that was me again. So we take a look at the tools we have. So we have Apple School Manager, which is just DEP for schools, or Apple Business Manager, I believe, is the other one now, right? Mm -hmm. Which I think is live. And we have Jamfro, with, which works with DEP. So I want to put them together. Um, Jamf is easy enough to put it with the EP, but how do we make it a good user experience and how do we make it easy? So we took a look at some apps that were already out there. Flash Buddy and the new kid was DEP Notify. So Splash Buddy was pretty enticing for us. Uh, we're looking at the pros and cons of it. Really nice UI, lots of functionality. It did allow user, it does allow user input, um, but there was a Bit of a setup involved. You have to read packages. You have to set up certain policies a certain way. You have to do a lot of like um, adding things to the package for to make it basically look good. Um, uh, and it was a lot more than we needed. We don't need everything that it gives. We just wanted something pretty simple. So we then look at the AP Notify and highly customizable UI. You can basically customize all the text in the, the image, the one image that's in there. Very simple setup. Um, almost no setup. There's very little that you need to do. But there was no user input. 
So we were like, okay, well, there's no user input useless for us. Let's go to Splash Buddy. And then Frederico Dees came out, or user FGD on Slack. And he uh, posted on the DEP notify, DEP notify, I guess it would be, uh, channel. Um, he was looking for people to test his forked build of DEP notify with user input. So I was like, oh, but tested it, I downloaded it, I got it set up, and it worked pretty well. It was really easy to set up. So, and then it got merged into the build, to the actual build, uh, after I actually wrote our process for this. So we took that out, and then we had user input. So we were just like, okay, no DEP notify. So we had a simplified, pro the simplified process we had in place was get a new machine, prep them with base OS. Um, with either DEP or uh, for new machines or internet recovery for a reused one. Uh, boot the machines to set up the install, install the software that was needed. Uh, when the machine was going to be assigned, we would rename it, enter the asset information, get it to the user, and then at the end have a cold beverage. So we took a look at the preparation first. So new machines would get assigned via Apple School Manager or DEP. Uh, we made sure pre stage was configured, so we would Figure that all up in pre-stage setup. Note that the checkbox here for require authentication, we have it unchecked because we want our techs to set these up. We don't, we're not like uh, some places where they just give a laptop to a user and the user signs in. Um, yeah, it's staff, faculty, they don't like that. They go, what do I want? What, what am I supposed to do? Do I, do I have to set it up? I, they, they panic. Um, and you tell them, oh, you have to do this while plugged into a wire. What do they do? They go on wireless and they don't get DP or they go home and it doesn't work. So we wanted our text to do it. So we, if one we uncheck that, it's great because our text can do it and you don't assign that computer to that tech that's working on it automatically. So we then create our local admin account. That's the other setting. So because we like having a, uh, an admin account on all of our university owned machines, um, note that we are skipping account creation because we're going to take care of that in our, in our process. Originally, the process was after the tech sets it up, they would log in, they would create the user manually, and they would then assign that computer there. There was a lot, a lot of steps actually that were involved with this. I have no choice. I have smart cards. Yeah. So I need to do it manually. Right. So, so this only works well mm -hmm. if you don't have really complicated security or other types of setup. I mean, the only bad thing about doing this is that you're going to have this account is you're going to be file vault enabled, and then the other one, I believe, is not by default. So, on new systems. We'd love to use another file. This, we wouldn't usually do an automated or remote push out with this, so this one's not really important to what I'm doing, but I just want to make sure that people, you know, that people know about it. Um, for machines that are already in our server, we can just utilize the start OS install binary uh, from High Sierra installer with a policy. Um, there are some useful flags that are available. These are the two that we use, the no interaction, which is an undocumented option, because I think it's still undocumented, um, that basically allows you to do the process without anything, any user input from the login, logged in user. And then erase install, which was just added recently, which is APFS only, but it basically wipes the drive and then lays down a fresh OS. It's really nice. It's getting us closer to that that magic button of mm. you know erase and erase all content settings. So you would push out the installer app in a policy. You would add the installer script, which it's a single line script. That's all it is, and you make that policy. Right. Note that there is a dollar sign four for additional flags. So you, when you're in, in your Jamf policy, you can add additional flags. So you can tell to not convert to APFS. You can um, have it erase install if you want to. So what's nice about this is that you can make a self-service policy. That would just, when the user clicks it, if they have the erase install selected, it would just erase the computer and install fresh OS, and they're at a brand new screen. And then DEP takes over. And we, we actually use this method for our techs when they're out and they want to just completely blow a computer away and put the newest on there. We try to use that. Uh, we don't have a lot of APFS machines because except for the laptops. IMAX, we still buy spinning rust, unfortunately. The curse of education. And for machines that are not in Jamf or you can't use erase install, which we can't, you just boot with good old command R, brings up your Mac OS utilities, and you can go from there. 
wipe your machine, boom. So going back to our steps, we just prepped our machine, next we should deploy. So deployment, just simply booting the machine, getting the mobile config, installing the software. But we ran into a problem is what if you don't know who's getting that machine? Um, how are you going to figure out what software gets installed? Because sometimes it's based on who's getting the machine or what department. So we don't assign the machine till the next step, which is assignment here, right? So we combined them. It was just easier. So, you know, two is less than three steps. It's easier. Um, so after we prep the machine, that machine, a lot of times when our university preps it, the machine just, they prep it and they put it away. It goes into a storage or it goes into a, 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 a room and gets and, and it sits there until somebody needs it or until it's deployed to somebody. Because a lot of times um, our faculty is gone for the summer. Um, and if they're getting a machine, they're not going to come in and grab our machine. They're going to wait till the next with all this software and then only to find that it needs to be erased again. So instead, we just take care of everything one time. Am I running OK on time? OK. Uh, so this is what we had. And this was trusting that process. We installed the AP Notify with our app, with our app package, uh, logo, and a script to do the things for all the things that we want to get done. All right? Sounds great, but we ran into issues. First, we found it was running behind the login window common issue, right? So what we did is we just added a wait for doc loop. Didn't fix our issues though. Uh, it only worked about 60% of the time because it started running before the user was completely logged in. The doc uh, um, um, process would start and sometimes the enrollment trigger would just boom, go right off and go on, on the races. So we added another timer. Still didn't work every time because everybody knows the timers are not going to work anyway. We, it worked, it was it was getting close, but we wanted it so it was almost 100% foolproof. Actually, basically it's 100% foolproof. So we had it, we would also have edge cases where it would run again um, in the background for some reason, but and since we have a caffeinate line in our script, it would just sit there running and nothing would happen. It would detect the walk away or do something weird about it or disconnect from the network. So we solved that with a launch daemon. So we look at our step again. We're installing DEP notify with a payload, but this time we're going to add a launch daemon with the deployment script. So this is the package that we created. Got the app. We put it in var temp. Um, I've heard a lot of people are, are actually utilizing DEP notify for other things like updaters or things like that. And great idea. And we might actually start doing that. So we're probably going to move where that goes eventually. but. For now, it's just going to be bar temp. Got our logo and our provisioning script. And the script gets called by our launch daemon. This is what our launch daemon looks like. It's, if you've seen a launch daemon, it's what it is. Uh, pretty straightforward. It just loads our provisioning script right there. 10 seconds after login is complete, um, or 10 seconds after the policy runs. So sometimes the enrollment trigger occurs if the user's logged in. And if that's the case, it'll just run after that happens. Um, the James server, for some reason, will doesn't run enroll the script uh, the uh, the enrollment trigger exactly at enrollment. It sometimes waits. I don't know. Uh, sometimes it's also just about when the computer responds or when the server reaches out. Um, timing is a little weird with Jamf sometimes. When it says every 15 minutes, it doesn't mean every 15 minutes. It means around 15 minutes. Every 15 minutes, it's a five minute delay. Anything random zero delay. to third, third six hundred or something like that. Yeah. It's a random delay yep. So go back. Then we have a post install script, and our post install script will launch, or will adds a bunch of things, but this is the important one. Just loads our launch daemon as soon as that package runs. So what's great about this too is you can send this package to somebody and just have them run it. Wanted to. Um, the extra stuff up there is just to disable certain auto updates, so it doesn't update when. It's sitting on the bench, you know, just in case installer starting to run. So we just disable a bunch of things in there. So our package is done. And we create our enrollment policy. Pretty straightforward. It's just enrollment trigger. All right. Put our custom PKG in there. And note that I call this one backstaff. Uh, this one's still RC2. This was before the uh, release. The release was actually done with um, 
the user input. But um, we have a different package. We're going to have a different package for every cohort, as we call them, uh, type of computer, public, fax staff, and checkout machines, and office machines. Um, we just like having one. We just like being able to deploy one package instead of having to make uh, different policies with different scripts in, in there and everything. Um, plus, it's a pretty simple script. If anything needs to change, it's usually going to be on the policy side. So once Deep can notify is installed, one thing left to do is have our launch daemon do run provision script. It does this stuff. So we're going to see that in action right now. So let's put this all together. So everybody knows this screen, right? You have to go through setup assistant. All right, click next, click the keyboard. And there's the screen right there. This tells us that it's, it's tied to a server, it's got DEP, and it's ready to roll. So you click continue and you wait. wait. I don't know if anybody else has the same issue, but sometimes it will take five minutes to complete this part. Sometimes it goes 30 seconds, but most of the time for us it takes forever. Um, it has something to do with the account creation, I think, and file vault, or I, it, it's, it's something it's weird. But eventually it does complete, and when it's done, we are greeted with our login window with user account that we created, Mac admin. So again, if this is a, per, a tech setting it up, they can put this computer away. It's basically done for them to do, if they want to just walk away. But if they don't know who it's going to, or um, if they take the computer out and they're ready to give it to somebody, they just log into Mac Admin, and they're greeted with this window. Our logo, some text says process will assign the device, install base software, and it says just waiting for you. That's really nice. So what we do is we make it so it waits. All right, user has to click assign before it does anything. And, what it, and let's take a look at the code with that side by side. So there's our code. Sorry, it's really hard to see. Um, again, the thing will be online. DP notifies launch because it's waiting for it waited for Finder, waited for Doc. It's making sure that it's not in the MB setup user account because we solved that too. Um, and it's also making sure that this setup setup done file, um, which it's just a receipt, it's just a, a bomb that goes into your your receipts uh, DB. Uh, it's making sure that's not there. We drop that at the end. It basically just tells the server or tells the tells the um, script like, "Hey, if you're still trying to run, don't run anymore." It also gives us a nice receipt to know that it's been done on the server side. So we wait for the doc. Uh, the window looks that way because these commands were sent to the log file. So the log files bar temp DP notify log. All DP notify does is read that file for these things: command colon, and then you give it a command. A, a command. So we just tell it the main title, which is that, tell it the main text, give it an image, and then the terminate manual, which is just setting up our uh, progress bar. You can customize that. We can also technically tell, have it read from the Jamf log, um, also the monkey log. Um, you just send the monkey flag or the Jamf flag. Um, we didn't like how it looked with the Jamf log because it does read a lot more stuff and it's not as pretty. We also don't name our policies like, now installing this, it basically is just called like, Office 2016 version. And we didn't like users seeing that, so we just set it up ourselves manually. Um, all right, so then we launch it. Where's my mouse? There it is. Then we launch it after sending that info to the log. Now, the interesting thing is that just it's just waiting for the user to hit assign. Um, we set it up that way I, as I went over because we want to make sure they use the text complete this, all right, or they don't miss it. So if I put that at the end, they might walk away, and it might just be sitting there at the end, and it might reboot, because we reboot at the end. So we wanted to just wait until they enter that information. So put that in. Why did that not go? Because my mouse is being dumb. There we go. Down here, it's just waiting for DNP list. It's just a, a P list file that gets dropped after we run our uh, user assignment. So just literally just sitting there, do this while that file's not that file's not there. So it's just literally sitting there waiting. So when the user hits, oh, come on, PowerPoint, work with me here. So the user clicks assign, registration window drops down. This is customizable. You can have up to two text fields, you can have up to two drop downs, and there's a checkbox. If you have sensitive data on that machine, you check that box and it adds a flag in your P list. 
Um, that is why is that not working? <laughs> okay. Yeah, that window is populated by this part of the code. It's just a default write to the Nomad, um, the Nomad uh, Dev Notify um, preference file, and you just put all your placeholders in here. Can you set that up to LDAP, like with the username and have it search? Um, unfortunately, I don't know if you can, but you, there sh I'm sure if you have a script that will that checks it, you can probably do that. Now, um, there might be a way to do it in Dev Notify itself, but I unfortunately I don't know that. Uh, do, 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 do. Oh, and apparently they added a bunch of new features. Like, so you could have a EULA and a registration window um, because it used to be one or the other. Now you can have both, and the EULA is also uh, reads RTF, um, and you can add images and all sorts of other things. So it seems like they're adding things like every week now. So the user input's done, and then we can be begin the test. So first, we're grabbing the username from the plist file. Uh, again, it's a long block of code. Uh, it was created after registration, and we're holding it to create the local account later. We're then passing more commands in depth notify log window or log file so that our window has changed. So you can see now it says prepare new system, don't shut it down, installing base software. And then we also are running our enrollment policy that I that we created. So all that's done just in those parts of the line or parts of the uh, program. When did this get down to a domain? Or is that coming up later? The, uh, you can bind that at, um, you can do that in your policy. Yeah, I do it at pre, I do yep. it pre stage. So you could technically do it in pre stage still. It's not going to, it shouldn't mess with anything. Um, but um, then you wouldn't have to, you can just remove the create a local account. But when you have the local, when that creates a local account, do you have an option to create a mobile account? So I, I can at the moment, no, we don't, we don't do that on our laptops. So we just create an account with the Jamf binary. Right, you have to do it through the. You have interface. to do it through the, the deployment process. So right. We, we, we have it. We, I have it. Uh, I have it set on um, pre-stage to to mobile to, during the main. Go to main with mobile account and confirm. And I I in it. Yeah, you said. You I mean, I'm sure. It. So again, I'm sure that'll work with this because all this is doing is just running after the enrollment trigger. Because are your, are your machines encrypted? Or? Oh, see, mine, see, mine are encrypted, and they have to be a mobile account. Yeah, we're, account. We, we don't. We yeah, just have file on enabled to use it if we need it. Yeah, pre-staging, all that. You can do the configuration. Right. Right. This this wouldn't be used for that, though. This is just for bootstrapping and installing the software. So um, after the policies run, though, we're just creating a local account here based on the username that was entered, and we're just setting a password to the username temporarily. <laughs> Um, and then we're going to assign the and rename the device. Right there, we're going to run a, a thing called enroll assign device. It's another script that I've created that basically just takes that asset tag and the user ID and assigns that computer to somebody in the Jamps using uh, in the Jamps server with the binary or with the uh, API. So it's just reading the plist that was dropped, and then it sets up an XML. Passes that to the Jamf API and then it renames the machine using the assigned username with a prefix of MBA or MBP or nothing if it's neither one of those. And then we, uh, at the bottom here, we update our extension attributes we have uh, for receipts that we have. It basically just drops the computer name that uh, in there just in case the user uh, renames that computer. Because we don't block teachers and staff from renaming their computer, but this file will drop that computer name of what it was at image time, so we can then search against that if we need to, if we're not sure if that's the right person's computer. And then we just clean up the XML file. So back in the script, we're going to run a recon. Put all that new data in there. Up the head a little bit. I think I did. You can tell I haven't used PowerPoint in a while. Um, to get all the new data, so it's going to run a recon. You'll see it says updating inventory because we set that in there with the status command. And we're going to run software updates. We're also changing the text in our DEP notify window until the tech that it's almost done because it said by this time they're probably like, oh my god, why is this not finishing if they haven't gone to go to the bathroom or get coffee? Um, and after software updates, we just send a command to DEP notify to restart the machine right away. Because there are other commands you could use are log out or quit. Um, but we just and or hit OK to reboot, but we just we just reboot it because and if the tech walks away, 
We don't care that they're not there to see it reboot. Um, so right as that happens, we also clean up the files that we had installed, the, our logo, the DP notify, and our logs. And down here, we are creating that bomb file. Yes, Tom, the UART's provisioning done. And we're removing our launch daemon. Uh, we don't unload the launch daemon because we had issues with that, so we just remove it. And then when the computer reboots, it, it's gone. Uh, the great thing is that since this bomb file's there, if, say, the launch daemon doesn't get removed, it won't run anyway again because the, the, the if statement the, in the script will just be like, oh, it's there. I don't have to run it anymore. So you reboot, and we have our new local account there. And that's it. And our software's all up in there and all installed and works really well. So there we go. There's our new process. Two steps, kind of, if you just count the top two. It's two steps, right? So is this really imaging? No. Not really. And I mean, it's OK, because it works well enough that it doesn't have to be imaging right at this point. But we do want to look at the next steps um, as to what we're hoping that it's going to come. So first thing we're looking at is we're going to look at a more automated process for our public machines. And actually, um, I am working on that currently because Neil Martin has already created a script and a process for doing this that it will look for information in the Jamf server. And if it's already there, you don't have to enter information or or it skips over something. Uh, it, it'll skip over to user account creation and all the other questions that it might ask. Um, we want to hope that Apple gives us a way to have 100% zero touch. Um, I don't think that's too hard to ask, but zero touch as in not just for IT people, I mean for everybody. So we can just send out a command and the computer reboots with the EP already added, and you could then do all your stuff there instead of having to go through setup assistant and bootstrapping and all this other stuff. Um, the new erase install flag gives us hope that this might be coming soon. Um, it only works on EPFS, unfortunately, which according to 10.14 might be APFS might work on all drives now. So I don't know how they're going to do that, but hey, cool. Um, but we still have to go through setup assistant after reboot, which kind of sucks. And finally, you see what Jamfest offer. And I know they're working on something, and it's not like secret or anything. It's in one of their feature requests. Um, and I've actually been in their WebExes. Um, they've invited me and my colleague and a bunch of other people to check out what they have. We've seen wireframes. We've seen other mock-ups. We've seen, um, we went through the process of which one looks better? Which one do you like better? What kind of features do you want? And where should it be? So we've been going through that with them. But we are a long ways off from that, I believe. I mean, they're probably. I, I wouldn't be able to tell you when it would come out, but there, we literally only saw mockups. Nothing like that you can tangibly use. So a little while away, but hey, maybe they'll come up with something. And so far, I will admit though, so far I do like what I see from them. Um, I just hope that it uh, gives us the same customization that Dev Notify does. Um, and if it doesn't, I mean, hey, we'll stick with Dev Notify. So. Thank you very much. If anybody has questions or comments, I'm sure if there's any in the Slack or in person here, feel free to ask them. Um, and then there's some resource links. Um, you get to my script on my Git. There's Dev Notify. The blog post that I wrote on my website about this process, so how we started with without the launch demon and how we got to the launch demon. And then Neil Martin's process. He did a Janfnisha Roadshow in London, and it was um, really good to. It's also the inspiration for me doing this presentation. I saw it and I was like, I have to present on this too. So, awesome. Yeah. Don't know if anyone. Yeah. So well done. <clears throat> you know, as I mentioned, you know, since we're probably going to be going right into some FDA stuff and we're talking about some of the WWDC stuff, uh, we're going to cut the stream. So, thank you all for tuning in. And uh, we'll talk about it next time. Just cut the audio. Too. Just cut the audio.